it, it just did. Okay. Yep. It it'll pop up on the left hand side of your screen. Yep, it's up now. Okay. I don't think I see it because I'm in a private screen. So um, so good morning. Thank you guys so much for uh, rescheduling to the non Thanksgiving week to do case reviews. I appreciate your time this morning and uh, a couple cases that I thought were interesting to discuss for this month. <clears throat> I can. Huh. Oops. There we go. So as always this information is privileged and it should be kept confidential it's protected by the hipaa act and that copying distributing is um, strictly prohibited so for the first case this is of a 50 year old male ems was called for a man down on um, i think it was mill plane they found him unresponsive their ppe usage was maximum for any condition and the vital signs that they obtained were within a minute of patient contact, noted that he was not tachycardic, heart rate of 76, but he was hypotensive at 80 over 50. His respiratory rate was eight, his GCS was three, and his SpO2 was 86. It was obvious that he had sustained hey, trauma. Hey, Jackie, Dr. Jackie Gable. sorry to interrupt. I think your screen's frozen. Okay. Don't know how to fix that one. Um, actually, yeah, if you do that, that's the best way to do it. If you um, and then reselect share my screen. OK. Are you able to see it now? Yeah, but no, yes, but I. We we see it, but it hasn't moved forward. So I suspect that you have to go into. Um, no, I think this is the same mode. No, I think this is the same problem. So I'm trying to share it off of a incognito screen. So I think that because of that, it's showing that it's paused. So I'm going to stop sharing off the incognito screen. <clears throat> It'll just require me to bounce back and forth to get you the video. All right, can you see that okay? Yes. So it was obvious that this gentleman had suffered some trauma. He had facial trauma. He was found, if I remember correctly from documentation, prone in the street, but no vehicles were around. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't that, it didn't appear that this patient had fallen into the street. The suspicion was that he was an auto pedestrian. Um, he had a, he was unresponsive. His airway was open. It was unlabored, but he wasn't protecting, and there was blood in his airway. His skin was pale, warm, and dry. He had a weak radial pulse. No history is available, as there's no bystanders, and the patient wasn't able to provide any. And that he was found in the roadway. They are unclear to what had caused him to be injured or unresponsive. Spinal precautions were obtained immediately. The initial patient contact occurred at 1.38 in the morning. And it also, from the documentation, was the time that they initiated transport. <clears throat> the patient um, was, was sent or brought in as a full trauma. Um, they noted severe facial trauma on exam. At one minute, they get the vital signs that I mentioned. Because of his hypoxia, they placed him on 15 liters non uh, non-rebreather, or nasal cannula, actually. At two minutes, they started an IV, started him with 150 mLs, and he checked his blood glucose, which was normal limits. At four minutes, they started bagging him. And at five minutes, they got a subsequent uh, set of vital signs, noting that his heart rate's 81. He's still hypotensive at 88 over palpation, and his respiratory rate's 12, GCS of 6. At six minutes, they initiate RSI with 200 milligrams of ketamine and 150 milligrams of succinylcholine. At nine minutes, they place a ET tube on first pass using video laryngoscopy. And at 11 minutes, they arrive to Peace Health. 
One of the things that I didn't put in the subsequent slide is, I don't know, ideally we would like to get an oscillated blood pressure initially, at least the first one. And as you can see here, all blood pressures were palpated. So if there was some technical difficulty in getting a blood pressure that was oscillated, it should be documented. So here, I thought that reviewing this case, they did a great job of correcting his hypoxia. They, although they see facial trauma, they looked for other possible reversible causes such as blood glucose and that they were successful using video laryngoscopy for first pass success. Their scene time was essentially zero, although I believe that the fire department had arrived first with EMS, um, transporting EMS shortly behind them. So no extended scene time according to the documentation of the times. And I mentioned that because uh, there's a little thing down here lower. But anyways, in that, um, they would practice permissive hypotension, but because the patient was already hypotensive with trauma, they initiated fluids, although the time to the hospital was very short. And what was I going to say? Oh, um, they document in their narrative that the there was a delay in in transport, but just a little bit um, contradictory based off of what they documented for times. So in the emergency room, he had multiple injuries identified by imaging. He had a dissection of his left vertebral artery. He had a subdural hematoma. He had a skull base fracture. He had a left frontotemporal fracture. He had a um, clivus and occipital condyle fracture. He had a left retrobulbar hematoma. He had a C1 fracture, he had a thoracic two and three fracture, he had a left adrenal injury, he had a left scapular fracture, a non-displaced manubrial fracture, zygoma and left orbital wall and maxillary sinus fracture. He had um, benzos on board and his alcohol level was 238. Um, he was extubated, he withdrew from alcohol and discharged on hospital day 13. I didn't see anything about if he recalled what happened if he got tossed out of a vehicle or whatnot, but some mechanism that caused significant injuries. And then what I should mention too is in the emergency room, he had, um, because of his retrobulbar hematoma and his intraocular pressures being elevated, he had a lateral, uh, a lateral, um, a lateral canthotomy in lysis. Uh, initially attempted by the ER doc, unsuccessful. Therefore, ophthalmology came in to decompress. So I thought this was an interesting case for retrobulbar hematoma. I'll have to get out of the presenting screen to show you the video of the procedure since I was trying to do that a different way this time and it was unsuccessful. So this is a condition that causes blood to collect behind the globe and that the causes can be trauma, iatrogenic, even Valsalva, especially if they're on anticoagulation, sometimes from excessive hypertension or accelerated hypertension or hypertensive emergencies, or if there was some type of vascular anomaly, such as an AVM. The risk, this is compartment syndrome of the eye. And as we're familiar with compartment syndrome of the muscles, um, there can be compartment syndromes of anywhere that is in self-contained area that impedes blood flow to and fro the organ. And the risk of this is that you can go on to become blind. Um, it is considered a ophthalmologic emergency in that the diagnosis can be suspected by exam, the patient's eye is proptotic or that it protrudes um, out further from the orbit as compared to the other side. Uh, the patient may have decreased visual acuity. There may be evidence of periorbital hematoma or that the patient's unable to move his, his or her eye, um, a paralysis potentially from a fracture with impingement of the uh, muscles of the eye. In that this can be suspected by exam and confirmed ideally by by pressures, as long as there's no globe rupture, and that would be done at the hospital setting, although CT imaging can confirm it, but we should be identifying this early before waiting too long, especially since we're talking about the potential for uh, blindness. In, as I mentioned, hospital determination would be imaging and also confirming by intraocular pressures.
And the treatment is that this is an ophthalmologic emergency. Ophthalmology should be consulted in the hospital setting and that a canthotomy and cantholysis should be performed. Let me stop presenting so I can pull up this video and then I'll pull it back up. should be able to see my screen again. Yes. All right. <clears throat> so this is a it's a it's a very into in my opinion interesting procedure. It doesn't occur frequently. I have personally never performed this procedure on a human on animals in residency. Yes. Um, and obviously this is a video not to show you how to do it as this should not be performed in the pre-hospital setting, but just to give you an idea of this is how we treat a um a uh retrobulbar hematoma natural warmth the orbits have shown in this video can be decompressed periocular ecchymosis can be seen intraoperative fundoscopy shows extremely abnormal central retinal vein pulsation with the vein almost winking as outflow is choked that would be done Minimal with external a pressure on the globe, direct laryngoscopy completely occluded. i mean a uh, Direct off, uh, this patient is under general anesthetic, but this procedure may be done under local anesthetic with generous local anesthetic infiltration. So a hemostat used the this is clamp lamp the forcep, and then cut along the crush line, dividing skin and orbicularis towards the lateral orbital rim. This is a lateral canthotomy. The lower eyelid is drawn laterally and away from the globe with toothed forceps to put the lateral canthal tendon on stretch. Closed forceps or scissors can be used to identify the tendon. It feels almost like strumming a guitar string. It is then transected. This is lateral canthalysis. There may be a big egress of blood, as you see here, but if there is not, then the lateral canthus must be further opened. So just a very interesting condition and um, management in a, in a patient that I'm not sure if the crews were aware of the follow-up. I think someone's trying to talk. Yeah. All right, so moving on. Thank you. Dr. Gebois, uh, yeah. uh, I have one question about uh, for someone with considered to have considerable or significant head injury. Um, we would like to keep their pressure a little bit more in the 100 to 110 range by protocol. Yeah. Um, do you know what they did in the um, in the emergency department? I don't remember the details, but resuscitate them. Um, I don't remember. To, I'd have to look up the chart again, as this was the first case that I put together um, chronologically. So I don't know if he was no longer hypotensive. Um, if he, I mean, assuming assuming that you know, with him being a full trauma, that he would have gotten blood if he was still hypotensive, even if it looked to be an isolated head injury, just because of the mechanism of injury unknown. Um, Typically, we move towards blood resuscitation until we can identify that there's no active bleeding. Right. Well, you did, you did, you did mention that uh, one of the good things that they did was he, you said that we were, you were thinking of uh, permissive hypotension as the, he may have had other injuries. However, with a head injury, we'd want to keep his pressure a little higher. So yeah. uh, I, th I think it was really appropriate that, that they. As you said, that they did start some fluids. I'm just curious what his pressure was by the time they got to the to the department. But I can understand if you don't recall that right off the top of your head. I don't. I can definitely um, feed that back. No, no problem. No problem. Just bringing it up as a as no. A, it's a good point. It's a good point. It's a like I said. It's a a, a kind of a condition that I have not had the opportunity to 
treat with this procedure. And then as for review of our Southwest region protocols, as would be expected, as this is a rare condition to occur, there's nothing specific in our um, protocols to kind of guide as we would just be identifying these patients and hopefully um, ex hopefully expediting their transport to uh, definitive care for all of their trauma management, including their eye. But reminder is that occasionally this is not caused by trauma. All right, if no other questions, we'll move on to case two. So case two is a 56-year-old male that had been a victim of a house fire. His chief complaint were burns predominantly to his face. Um, he, the PPE usage by EMS included surgical mask and gloves. Vital signs obtained five minutes after patient contact noted that his heart rate was borderline tachycardic at 99, blood pressure of 161 over 102, respiratory rate of 18, GCS of 15, SpO2 documented at 100%, and there was no documentation that he was already on oxygen, so this is presumably room air, and his weight was 102 kilos. He was found to be awake. His airway was open. He was protecting his airway, but it was noted that he was hoarse sounding and that he had wheezes that were audible. His skin was pink, warm, and dry, past medical history unknown, and the history provided was that he was a resident of a fire of a house that had caught on fire. This occurred at 11.02 p.m. They documented that immediately after patient contact, pulmonary exam was, um, was performed and an IV was established and he was given one liter of IV fluids throughout his stay with EMS. I'm not sure if it was crystalloids or lactated ringers in case anybody ends up asking about that. Um, at five minutes, the vital signs that I mentioned were, um, were obtained and the decision was made to move towards RSI. Um, this is not, none of these pictures of these are, of any of these presentations or of the actual patient, but they documented that there was some um, burned burned hair and I believe soot in the airway in combination with the hoarse voice and the wheezes, they decided in the setting of a fire, they decided to move forward with RSI. So at 10 minutes, he was given 180 milligrams of ketamine followed by 145 milligrams of succinylcholine he was intubated with DL um, first pass one minute after our side meds were administered fully. At 17 minutes, he received 100 micrograms of fentanyl. His end tidal CO2 is obtained for the first time, or at least documented. It's noted to be 49. Another set of vital signs are obtained. He's now a little tachycardic and more hypertensive at 108 and 187 over 123. His respiratory rate's 10 from ventilation, and his GCS is 3 because he's sedated. Um, he gets 180 milligrams of ketamine and transports initiated at 24 minutes to a manual. Um, <clears throat> at 25 minutes, he gets his next round of fentanyl, which is just a little exceeding five minutes. I'm looking at um, eight, eight minutes since his last fentanyl. And then another set of vital signs are obtained. He's tachycardic. He's more hypertensive, 113 and 190 over 128. Respiratory rate of 11, GCS of 4, SpO2 of 95, and Tidal 42. And at this point, he's given 10 of Versed. You can note that after he gets his his next round, his Versed, that the next set of vital signs are markedly improved, um, which suggests that he may have been under sedated as a possibility because he's no longer tachycardic. He's no longer hypertensive. Heart rate's 89, blood pressure's 128 over 84, breathing 15 times a minute, GCS. I'm going to turn the fan at the door What's on that? that after we got knocked down, and I wouldn't have crawled through in advance. I'm not sure so, if that was somebody, somebody who wanted Somebody has their mic open and needs to Sorry, shut it. Dr. Gadbois, that was um, somebody logging in late. We they They have been muted. Okay, I wasn't sure if they were speaking about this case and feel free anybody who knows about this case or any cases to add additional information, especially if it's more helpful to understand the situation. But my observation here is that after he received both the pain and 
uh, additional dose of sedative, he had an an improvement in his vital signs. Um, at 45 minutes, he gets five milligrams of Versed. At 46 minutes, his next set of vital signs is still um, more um, improved with a heart rate of 78, blood pressure 124 over 84, respiratory rate of 10, and a GCS of 3. At 60 minutes, he arrives to a manual. So in reviewing this case, Dr. Mocht had reviews this, reviewed this case and recommended it for case reviews, but from what he had reviewed, and if he's on the call, he's more than welcome to give the discussion. Um, the mechanism of the injury and the differential diagnosis was excellent. The decision-making was excellent given the concern for airway inhalation burns, first pass uh, success with intubation, although we prefer with VL, um, DL was successful in the choice to go to a manual given that the patient's burn and concern for inhalational injury. Reviewing this myself, I thought that the ketamine dosing was a little bit less than what would be ideal, remembering that our dosing is two mg per kg, regardless if this is for RSI or post-intubation sedation, remembering that we want to be administering fentanyl every three to five minutes, regardless in that our ketamine dosing is is after 15 minutes unless the patient needs it um, following intubation and then considered every 15 minutes preferred to be administered over Versed unless ketamine is not available, then Versed to be the option. And then the only other feedback I had was that the patient was wheezing. We don't really know if he has an underlying COPD or asthma history, but if he was wheezing, I don't think there's any harm to at least giving him bronchodilators. So he made it to a manual, was admitted to the ICU, um, further resuscitated in the ED, and uh, he was bronched. He was noted to have a grade one inhalational injury. He was extubated the following day and discharged in good condition. And then I thought that it'd be good to know what a grade one inhalation injury is. So as you can see, it starts from grade zero down to grade four. This patient had grade one, so mild injuries, some minor or patchy areas of erythema, carbonaceous deposits in the proximal or distal bronchi, um, ext extending down to grade four massive injury where there's mucosal sloughing, necrosis, and obliteration of the lumen. So very difficult case when we have suspected burns to the airway without the ability to assess that appropriately with either um, awake laryngoscopy or um, bronchoscopy. So uh, definitely high index of suspicion and low threshold to move forward if you think that this patient or your patient has significant burns. So I did a little bit of research on inhalational injuries and they break it down to um, the complications for their airways, both mechanical and physiologic. Um, mechanical meaning that the more the more reliable would be soot in the oral cavity, singed hair um, externally, burns to the face or in the mouth. Um, to note, though, that if the patient doesn't have any burns in the mouth does not mean that they can't have burn-related, heat-related injuries distal to the oropharynx, such as, um, such as the epiglottis and the surrounding structures. They may also have edema, blisters, or ulceration. And then according to the study that I reviewed, um, they said that strider, hoarseness, drooling, and dysphagia are non-reliable indications of severe inhalational injuries, although I did find a burn airway management for a reputable hospital that included strider and hoarseness in our protocol also. So I would say, although there's conflict on how reliable that is. We have limited resources, and it's one of the things that we can do in the pre-hospital setting to help determine if our patients are um, potentially at risk of, of heat-related injuries or burns that can, um, can uh, worsen expeditiously. Um, and that the edema can develop from burns, burned airways or burned airway passages um, within a half an hour and it can lead to muscle, must, uh, mucosal necrosis up to 24 hours. Um, of note, a special consideration is that we all know that pediatric airways are smaller, um, so they're at much higher risk of having compromise um, in these kinds of conditions. And that the physiologic component for the airway complication is that 
there's not a lot of data to support this, but to treat patients with bronchodilators and steroids if they are having edema and wheezing. But I think that in our case, if we have wheezing in this condition, we should be considering bronchodilators. Um, and then consideration of other management conditions. So in these patients that are victims of burn injuries, the consideration for carbon monoxide poisoning, remembering that our SpO2 is not is not reliable to determine if the patient has um, carbon monoxide poisoning as that it detects binding to the hemoglobin regardless of its uh, carbon monoxide or oxygen. So I would have a low threshold to have these patients on oxygen until their CO levels can be uh, checked at the hospital. And then consideration for cyanide poisoning. Um, and the other thing is in our elderly patients, what may not be all that impressive of a fire-related injury may be enough of a stressor <clears throat> for them to have an MI. So I would I would highly recommend um, in 12 lead EKG on any of our older patients, I would say probably over the age of 50 personally, or if they have any complaints that might be cardiac. Um, one of the one anecdotal story is that we had um, a, an elderly couple in residency who both were CO poisoning um, from a fire, and they seemed to be totally fine, regard uh, stable at, at least. The husband was was intubated because of his altered mental status and unable to protect his airway, and his wife was absolutely no complaints. And we were diving them hyperbarically to help with their CO. Um, their CO exposure and she, I don't know if you know a lot about hyperbaric chambers, but it's a lockdown um, chamber that gets dived to a set uh, a set depth and it's not easy to get that chamber open. Well, she ended up having an MI and arrested in the chamber with just a nurse by herself managing the two. So my point is, is that, um, are, are these types of incidences can be essentially like a stress test on these patients and that we should also be considering potentially cardiac uh, injury from these from these exposures in addition to the CO and cyanide. All right, and then as for our protocols in regards to burns, that would be a good reminder to kind of review a pretty detailed and um, lengthy protocol, but there's a lot of good information in here. So as always, we're going to be taking BSI. We're going to be identifying shock, especially since these patients have a pre uh, predilection to become dehydrated or in shock because of if depending on how severe the burn is, but third spacing and dehydration. Um, remove any items early on that can be either stuck on the patient or that further swelling can make it difficult to remove. So clothing that's charred or burned over burned areas or any kind of jewelry that might be constrictive. Um, we have a burn classification reminder between the superficial, partial, and full thickness burns, as well as determining the body surface area using either the rule of nines or the palm method. Um, I think to pay particular attention to F, where the arrow is, is what conditions indicate that the patient should go to a burn center for us would be a manual. So I think it's worth going over these nine points. I'll make it quick. Um, partial thickness greater than 10% of any total body surface area. Burns that involve the hand, the face, the feet, the genitalia, the perineum, or major points, um, cosmetic, and potentially for uh, the concern for um, really sensitive areas such as the genitals and the hands and feet, um, full thickness to any age group, electrical burns, including lightning, chemical burns, inhalational injuries like this patient had been suspected of having, and then burn injuries that um, are that occur in patients with pre-existing medical conditions that can complicate their management. And then if a patient has a burn and a trauma, it would be it would be important to try to determine, do you think the burn is more uh, more dangerous for this patient compared to the trauma? If the burn is substantially worse, like let's say they sprained their ankle running out of the building, but they'd already suffered their burns, that is someone that should go to a, a burn center. But if this was a 
high speed mechanism motor vehicle crash that also had suffered some burns when the vehicle caught in fire. It's the underlying trauma that would be needed to be evaluated and stabilized before moving that patient to a burn center. So the most appropriate trauma center would be for that second scenario. Um, and then burn patients that require special social, emotional and rehabilitative intervention. Then um, our protocol goes on to management. So management is stopping further burn by cooling the area, giving pain meds, managing airway if there's any compromise to the airway or suspected imp um, impending compromise, um, IV access and IV fluid resuscitation. Depending on age, we have some guidelines on how much they should be getting an hour. And the other possibilities, as mentioned um, in the previous slide, such as um, cyanide, um, any kind of chemical or electrical burns. All right, any uh, questions about case two? All right. So case three is of a 42 year old female that was heard to have collapsed by her husband and was found down in their household. She was unresponsive. Her PPE or EMS's PPE usage was maximum for the condition. They noted that she had no heart rate, therefore the blood pressure was not able to be obtained. She wasn't breathing and her GCS was three. Her weight was estimated 130 kilos and that her primary survey was that she was unresponsive. Her airway, airway was open, but she wasn't protecting. She was apneic, she had no pulse and she was pale, warm and dry. Her past medical history for a relatively young individual is that she was on dialysis for renal failure. She was obese. She had type two diabetes, high cholesterol, and that she had some kind of condition that required her to have an um, internal cardiac defibrillator. And that her husband was able to provide some history to EMS stating that he heard her fall. He found her unresponsive. He had last seen her maybe 15 minutes earlier without any complaints. She hasn't been complaining of anything prior to um, that day in that she was getting ready to go to dialysis. He started CPR at the um, direction of dispatch. Prior to transporting agency's arrival, um, she had an eye gel placed and Lucas compressions were being performed. Um, dialysis was scheduled for the same day as mentioned and she had a end tidal CO2 of 38. Um, a humeral IO was placed in, I mentioned displaced because there were three total placed. So she, uh, at two minutes, her blood glucose was checked at 244. She was given one milligram of epi and then her own internal cardiac defibrillator fired three times and she was um, following the internal cardiac defibrillation. She was in sinus tachycardia. And my understanding from the documentation is that her own ICD led to her humeral IO being displa displaced. She was given 50 milli equivalents of bicarb at four minutes and at seven minutes she was given um, one gram of calcium gluconate. Let me see if this, yeah, okay. Um, and I think that that was based off of the timing empirically because at eight minutes, another set of vital signs or the first set of vital signs were obtained, um, which I think the timing's a little bit off. It probably was her ROSC time instead of the 10 minutes, but nonetheless, heart rate 110, blood pressure 148 over 76, respiratory rate 18, GCS of three and SpO2 of 98, uh, they got the 12 lead here, and you can see that it's tachycardic. She's got this wide complex, um, doesn't quite meet like your typical bundle branch pathology, and she's got these rounded T waves that make you, with a setting of cardiac arrest in a dialysis patient, um, hyperkalemia is definitely a possibility of uh, what's going on here with her. Um, so they say ROSC somewhere between the eight and 10 minute mark. Uh, 12 minutes of right tibial IO is, pl is placed because they lost the humeral IO. That ends up getting displaced, a repeater 12 lead, which is similar to the previous ones. I didn't put it up here. So they place a tibial IO on the left side, remember, reminding all of us listening that we should not be placing another IO in the same 
in the same bone because of the um, potential for extravasation since it's already been the integrity of the bone has already been compromised by the first IO. So great job in recognizing that um, it can lead to compartment syndrome where we've had I've been um, involved in care of patients that that it was not conveyed that the patient had already had an attempt um, in an IO in a tibia and then another tibia tibial IO was placed and the patient's leg was um, profoundly um, swollen uh, following following admission and requiring a fasciotomy. At 28 minutes, a uh, decision was made to replace the eye gel and to um, RSI this patient. So 30 milligrams of automidate was provided and then 200 milligrams of succinylcholine. At 31 minutes, uh, the patient was intubated successfully using video laryngoscopy on the second attempt. At 36 minutes, the patient appeared to be stably achieving ROSC, therefore transport was initiated. She received 10 milligrams of albuterol and she was get, was administered uh, post-intubation sedation at 50 micrograms of fentanyl, 200 of ketamine. Um, at 44 minutes, a, another SpO2 and tidal CO2 was obtained and an additional dose of fentanyl was administered and she arrived to the hospital at 44. So reviewing this case, Rapid resuscitation, humeral IO, as we talked about, is preferred over tibial, um, early blood glucose check, and management of hyperkalemia, especially in a patient at high risk with hemodialysis. Uh, post ROS 12 lead was obtained, and then using both BL and Bougie, she was intubated successfully. Um, and then the post intubation sedation package was appropriate timing and medication. The only um, two things here that I have is that her uh, choice of induction, so preferably not succinylcholine, given that she um, is concerned for hyperkalemia, so rocuronium would be preferred, and then um, calcium gluconate, she got one gram, the protocol indicates for three grams of calcium gluconate. Dr. Gabois. Yeah. The, other th the other thing about that is that the uh, the timing of the two drugs, sodium bicarbonate was given before the calcium, and it's just the opposite. I yes. did talk to I did talk to both medics about that, and they, you know, slapped their forehead and said, "Oh, let's, uh, you know, uh, you know, I should have could have had a V eight too." So, will you would you mind saying why that's important? Why can't we just give it all at some point during the resuscitation. Why is calcium important first? Well, calci the calcium is considered mo mostly a membrane stabilizer at that point. And uh, uh, so it is, it's, it's more important and seems to work better than uh, just the alkalinization. Now, the other thing that could have occurred in this, I noticed that between the time they got the, besides the fact that there was too little calcium gluconate given, um, there's a long, they've been, they've been involved in this a long time, uh, and they could have, they could have repeated the treatment of either one, uh, at at about the same time that they did the suctional calling. Now I would not have done the suck. I already spoke to the medic about that too. The suctional calling was not indicated in this. If you're going under the assumption there's hyperkalemia, as you pointed out. Yeah, it's perfect. And you know, I think the membrane stabilization is really important. Um, the way that I think about it, or I teach it, is that. <clears throat> is the rhythm that you have what you want to keep and you don't want it to deteriorate. So like if she was in cardiac arrest, that might not be as a convincing um, statement, but if you want to make sure that your patient does not fall, uh, decline to like a sine wave or BFib, then the calcium is going to be more helpful to keep that rhythm stable until you can shift the potassium. So think of it as a freeze button. Right. And, and the, in the medics thought that one gram of calcium gluconate was equivalent to one gram of calcium chloride, but I pointed out to them that that is the that 
it's not true. There's only a third as much calcium available in calcium gluconate per gram as there is in calcium chloride. Absolutely. But, you know, and, calcium, and, and I, I, the other teaching point on that is that the reason, the whole reason we use calcium gluconate is because it doesn't, it isn't quite, it, it's, it's, it's not isotonic, but it's much closer to isotonic. So then calcium chloride, which is extremely hypertonic. And so if you extravasate calcium chloride, you get one nasty necrosis of tissue. Yeah. Um, in, you know, helping EMS with determining when they can stop managing hyperkalemia, um, you can think of it as if you suspect hyperkalemia, you would be administering your meds and repeating your 12 lead. And that if it's suspected, you're going to redose until your QRS is no longer wide. Yeah, so, assuming, assuming they don't have a, a bundle branch block bundle. to start with. <laughs> Correct. Correct. So, what happens for us in the hospital setting, especially if our pa patient is very unstable and we're thinking that they're going to uh, arrest and we we suspect or know that they're hyperkalemic but based off of a lab test, it's not uncommon for us to redose until we see narrowing of the QRS until we can get another uh, another potassium level. But that might be something helpful besides just waiting 15, 20 minutes is that it's suspected, the patient's arrested, and she or he is a dialysis patient and suspected to either be non-compliant or a non-functioning fistula or graft or whatnot, that serial 12 leads can help guide you there, especially if that's your if that's your decision making on when to redose them. So in the emergency room, she was hypotensive and tachycardic. They noted that the ET tube was deep. They had no breast sounds on the left. Her SATs were less than 88%. She re-arrested again. The tube was retracted after a chest X-ray confirmed that it was too deep. Um, her SpO2s did improve following tube, re um, tube retraction. And she was treated with calcium gluconate, bicarb, insulin, and glucose. I, um, want to point out that the glucose because i think that it's a common misconception is that glucose doesn't shift potassium glucose manages the hypoglycemia that the insulin might um cause which actually insulin shifts potassium so um her potassium despite the management that she received in the pre-hospital setting and the initial resuscitation showed that her potassium was severely elevated at 7.5 she did she did achieve ROSC a few times. She had multiple codes, including PEA, VFib, Torsades. Um, she did receive some magnesium. And ultimately, after she went into a bradycardia PEA, the decision was made after no cardiac activity on ultrasound to call her at 30 minutes. So just a little reminder about hyperkalemia, um, something that we... We, we see relatively frequently. Um, so values greater than 5.5 is considered hyperkalemic. Mild is 5.5 to 6. Moderate is 6.1 to 7. And severe is greater than 7. Hers was 7. Point, hers was 7.5. And that when the potassium, I'm going to wait till we silence that. Um, and then in her condition or anyone whose potassium is elevated, it causes abnormal um, heart and skeletal muscle function leading to arrhythmia and an untreated death. The risk factors are going to be acute renal failure or chronic renal failure with potassium not being um, extracted from the body. And then you can see this with severe dehydration, rhabdomyolysis, and some medications. Uh, this image on the right here kind of tells you about what medications are known to be associated, so beta blockers. Um, any spironolactone, um, eflurinone, as well as calcium channel blockers can lead to impaired potassium excretion or uh, excess potassium serum. 
And then diagnosis in our setting, in the pre-hospital setting, is going to be based off suspicion, history, and your EKG. So you're initially seeing a peak T wave, widening QRS, further um, widening QRS till you get sine wave, and then eventually V-fib or asystole. We have a uh, pretty, pretty clear protocol for hyperkalemic management. Um, who to suspect it in, anybody who's on dialysis, um, anybody who's got known muscle muscle abnormalities such as muscular dystrophy or if they're paraplegic, if they've had impairment to their muscles such as a crush injury, um, get a 12 lead, look for signs and symptoms which might be weakness, tingling, numbness, and EKG changes that su should suggest that the patient is hyperkalemic treatment is going to be three grams of calcium gluconate, one milliequivalent per kilogram of sodium bicarb. Remembering most patients are 70 kilos or bigger. And then albuterol, five milli milligrams um, continuous for a max dose of 20 milligrams. Any questions? All right. Last case, home stretch. Thank you guys for your attention. This is a case of a 48-year-old female. Um, this is a case of a 48-year-old female. She texted her ex-husband um, sentences that suggested that she was suicidal. She was found in the bathtub, unconscious. Um, PPE usage is maximum. Vital signs were obtained five minutes after patient contact, noted to be tachycardic at 111. Normal tense of at 128 over 65, respiratory rate of 21, GCS of 3, end title of 28, and her blood glucose was 143. She was an average weight um, individual. Uh, primary surveys, this patient was unresponsive. Her airway was open, but she wasn't protecting it, and she, stood, she did have a pulse. Her past medical history <clears throat> included all psychiatric, including um, prescriptions for lithium, clonazepam, and methylcarbamol. She had texted her ex-husband about an hour earlier saying that she couldn't handle life anymore and to tell him, to tell their kids that she loved them. He got over as quickly as possible and found her in the tub. Around her tub, there were pill bottles and um, wine or alcohol. And this was uh, a call that came out at 1832. At four minutes, she was ventilated with a bag valve mask at 25 liters, vital signs, as mentioned earlier, an IV was established at five minutes, and she was given 300 mLs of IV fluids. Initial 12 lead at 12 minutes shows a narrow complex, tachycardia. I don't see anything. Um, there's some evidence of uh, potentially early repolarization given the, the QRS um, amplitude. Maybe hyperkalemia, but more consistent with um, early uh, hyperpolar uh, hypertrophy is what I'm trying to get. At. Um, at 15 minutes, another set of vital signs: heart rate 112, blood pressure 127 over 71, respiratory rate of 23, GCS of 3, SATs now of 92%, and end titles 29. Decision was made to move forward with RSI. She was given 21 milligrams of atomate and 35 milligrams of rocuronium. At 22 minutes, subsequent vital signs obtained uh, shows kind of a lowering of her blood pressure, still tachycardic at 104, but blood pressure now is 106 over 64. Respirators of 22, assuming that that's the ventilation. Um, and then her SATs of 92%, she was intubated uh, with video laryngoscopy first pass. Uh, another 12 lead was obtained at 27 minutes and transport was initiated, largely unchanged. And then at 29 minutes, another set of vital signs, um, blood pressure now 122 over 77, heart rate 100, ventilated at 16, GCS remains three. At 30 minutes, a second IV was established. And at 37 minutes, she arrived to the hospital. I believe she went to Legacy Saving Creek. Um, initially, the review of this case, um, 12 lead got uh, obtained pretty early on, serial vital signs, identifying reversible causes, um, airway management with use of video laryngoscopy and first pass success. Now, I believe EMS had documented that they thought maybe she was hyperkalemic. 
but they didn't manage that. And I think that she wasn't, but nonetheless, um, her rocky rodent dosing was um, not for RSI. So it should be one big for KIG. And then post intubation sedation didn't really occur. She was 35, or I'm sorry, uh, 15 minutes after after intubation and um, no no uh, fentanyl, no ketamine. So in the emergency room, um, a central line was placed. Poison control was consulted because of her lithium to, uh, lithium overdose concerns. They recommended based off of the lithium levels that were resulted that she get dialyzed. Um, that central line that she had placed ended up uh, causing an iatrogen, iatrogenic pneumothorax, so a chest tube was placed. During her hospitalization, she developed serotonin syndrome, and her care was complicated with alcohol withdrawal. She was discharged into inpatient psychiatry on hospital day 16. <clears throat> Dr. So, yeah. One thing, I, before we go on to talk about lithium, one thing that I think is a good, uh, was, was also good in that, that I know, is that they did, um, they, they they had a they had a pre intubation CO2, and they sort of kept the patient. Actually, they overshot it a little bit. Her pre her ETCO2 pre intubation is 29, and an unconscious person who's uh, uh, with rapid respiration so that you have to assume that this is uh, a sign of acidosis, and so. Uh, once you intubate them, you want to keep them at roughly the same level they were before um, before intubation, so that you're oxygenating fine, but you're also still blowing off CO2 for them, so that they so that you can manage their acidosis. And with the lithium and possibly anything else that she might have taken that was at home, uh, she probably was acidotic. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great point. That's a really good point. So, <clears throat> for emergency medicine, we talk a we talk a lot about the possibility for lithium toxicity in that these patients need dialysis. <clears throat> so that's why I thought it'd be a good idea to talk about it with you guys. Um, I don't see a lithium prescribed that often. Um, I assume that that was a medication that was prescribed relatively frequently. Um, previously, but this medication is um, prescribed for patients that have like bipolar disorder, so it's something to stabilize their moods. And the mechanism of action is not well known. They think that there's a component of an SSS, SSRI, but they're not able to quite um, elicitate the mechanism of action. And this is an elemental um, iron or elemental metal. So. <clears throat> Apparently, this picture in the bottom right is uh, its natural form. This uh, lithium is excreted by the kidneys predominantly. That's why hemodialysis is often uh, the route for, for clearing this toxicity, in that a small percentage of lithium is excreted through sweat and feces. And that toxicity can occur from either excessive intake or impaired kidney function. So if they're um, dehydrated, uh, depleted, or there's a condition that causes their glomerular filtration rate or their kidney function to decline. So sometimes this is not um, intentional. Sometimes this is maybe a patient who has been found down for multiple hours um, or their kidney function starts to decline as they age. So not always due to intentional overdose. And that the toxic effects of lithium can affect the um, endocrine, the GI, neuro, renal, and cardiovascular system. Um, I'm going to kind of go over the mild to severe uh, presentations that the patient may complain about. So mild would be like nausea, vomiting, lethargy, fatigue, and tremors. And then severe could be coma, seizure, hypotension, and hyperthermia. And you can imagine moderate is somewhere in between that. Um, treatment for toxicity is hemodialysis untreated high prognosis or high likelihood for mortality. 
So this is our protocol for poisonings and overdoses. Um, it has a lot of good information here too. It doesn't We can't write protocols for everything, so it doesn't talk about lithium toxicity. I didn't see anything um, either about SSRIs, but as usual, BSI, manage shock, work up altered mental status differential, manage their airway, call poison control. Um, I don't know if you guys all have this poison control number in your head. Um, you can, I use the 1-800-2222-1222, no matter where I'm at, as long as I, um, as long as I'm on a landline, it'd be less likely for me to get the wrong poison control um, location, but that's a number that I can memorize pretty easily. So in review, the cases we discussed today were retrobulbar hematoma and management of this in the hospital setting. We also talked about burn injuries and how to identify what we think might be a substantial burn. So um, burned um, hair, uh, soot in the um, mouth, burns to the lips or the oropharynx, hoarseness, wheezing, and having a low threshold to control the airway before edema um, makes it virtually impossible without uh, potentially crike. And taking that patient to the most appropriate center as long as it's available would be a manual management of hyperkalemia. Um, an identification of hyperkalemia and that lithium is a medication that you should pay particular attention to when you're looking at a patient's med list and wondering if there are a possibility that this patient overdosed on it or that there's something in the history that suggests that there's impaired excretion and is this patient potentially toxic on lithium. All right, thank you guys. Three minutes to spare. Anyone have any questions? Um, as always, if you don't feel comfortable talking here, you can always email me or ask me in person. Dr. Gamboa, I think we had a question on the chat. Okay, yeah. I don't um, know what it me... is. Um, the question is, uh, just to clarify, the max dose of bicarbonate is 50 milli equivalents. Oh, I I right. would have to double check that. I, I know it's one milliequivalent per kilogram. Right. There may be in our protocol that we have a max dose. Let me we look. Do. Okay. We do. Yeah, that's, we actually that's, do. That's, it's basically one amp. Um, well, actually, it would be, it, yeah, it would be, yeah, and, um, but it can, that can be repeated. If you, if you see, if you see, if you see improvement in your 12 lead, so I think it was very appropriate you talked about that. If you see improvement in the 12 lead, and then if you have a long transport time or a long time with the patient and and you start to see it slipping back toward the previous 12 lead, then repeat the treatment. Definitely, and I'm, I mean, I'm looking at the <clears throat> app in the protocol for hyperkalemia. It doesn't give a max dose, but I'm looking for bicarb right now to see if that's as suspected as actually. It uh, references a max dose for bicarb in the medication list and and the approved medication list in the front of the protocol. Yeah. I'm... It doesn't say anything about repeat dosing. Yeah. We probably, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it'd be worth putting in the hyperkalemia a little blur, a little parentheses max of 50 or because I think that, I think it'd be easy for someone to look at hyperkalemia and say, one milliequivalent per kilogram per the protocol. Yeah. Well, we should talk about that and maybe do a little bit more in-depth research and see if there is a reason to go to only 50 or or if we could go, as we've done with all the other medications, we, we maxed our medication out at 100 kilo person. Mm -hmm. 
So we might just do the simple thing and drop to that. But um, well, let's talk about that. At the mo at the moment, we have it memorialized as 50 milli equivalents per kilo max. Uh, although I don't know that, as I think about it, that there's that much science behind that. No, that's a good question. Thank you, yeah. whoever um, made it. Um, S A. <laughs> well, thank you guys. Um, as you guys know, December, we won't have a case review, but um, I am always looking for good cases, things that you think that your colleagues can le learn about or that you found interesting. So please be sure to send them my way. Thank you, Dr. Gabor. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. That's it.